Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Professor Stephen Wordsworth, and I'm the head of school for nursing and professional practice at the, in the College of Health, Psychology and Social Care at University of Derby. And I'm delighted to be joining the student lecture series. This is a one of a number of events that the university has got planned. Uh, and today I'll be acting as chair uh, for the lecture series that's going to be presented by our very own uh, Dr. Paula Holt, MBE. Just before we get into uh, Dr. Holt's presentation, I just want to just uh, briefly explain what will happen. So uh, I'm going to a uh, bit of an introduction to Paula and to the topic at hand, and then Paula will deliver a, a lecture. And then at the end, we should have some opportunities for some Q&A. So if you've got any interesting questions or thoughts or comments that you want to make as a result of hearing what Paula's got to say, then um, please let me know in the chat uh, and, I'll, and I'll try and uh, make sure that they get fed into the to the Q&A &A session at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Paula. I just want to tell you a little bit uh, about Paula and some of her work, which is absolutely fascinating. And then we can um, move straight on into the series itself. So uh, Paula started her career as a general nurse. Uh, she's a specialising in acute medicine and then became a mental health nurse. So she swapped from adult to, to mental health. She then uh, took a really interesting career turn and went to join the, uh, the British Army. Uh, and she was in the British Army for eight years, uh, serving in the southeast of England and then uh, on into Germany and Scotland, where she headed up some mental health services for armed forces personnel and their families. Um, she undertook uh, some really interesting operational tours of Bosnia in 1993 to 94 and then back again in 1997. And at that point, she came back <coughs> to the NHS uh, and led a, a, a drug and alcohol team uh, and also a mentally disordered offending service. Um, she developed a, a court, mandate, court mandated drug treatment program for offenders as well. Uh, before joining higher education, she uh, had championed widening participation and supporting social mobility through a range of healthcare careers. Um, and she's making a success of higher apprenticeships and assistant practitioner and nursing associates interventions and programs. And to this day, she continues to to lead on those developments throughout widening access and careers. And her talk will feature some of those um, some of those uh, um, interesting topics today. As well as leading the College for Health, Psychology and Social Care, Paula leads on mental health across a range of initiatives within schools, employers and of course her work with veterans. She also leads on areas of equality, diversity, inclusivity, and that includes the on Athena Swan Charter and the Aurora programme, which is in, intended to support women into leadership roles. Paula is our executive lead for regulation for the Council of Deans for Health. And the Council of Deans for Health represents 92 universities that deliver health and social care across the UK. So she has a very senior role uh, on a national um, portfolio there. Over the recent years, she's been national discussions have led over um, the, the particular challenge of the pandemic uh, and in particular keeping nurses and allied health students on track uh, while supporting the NHS workforce. Uh, finally, what more can I say, but Paula received her MBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours List in 2020 for a contribution to, to health, education and veterans. Um, so, as I say, uh, let's ask Paula to introduce her topic and begin her lecture. Uh, and toward the end, we'll have uh, opportunities for some Q&A, but do please um, drop me a line in the chat function and I'll try and um, allow time for those questions and comments to be answered. Paula, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for that very kind introduction um, and a warm welcome to everybody who's uh, taken the time to, to tune in this afternoon. Really, really grateful. Um, and I hope it's an hour that will be enjoyable. Um, the lecture that I'm going to present is not going to be particularly um, academic in a sense. It's really going to be more about experiences and about, about who we are and what shapes who we are. Um, so the aim today is to look into a little bit of my personal experience of how I've navigated my world and my career. And the aim is to give you the opportunity at the end to ask questions as well, anything you like. But also, I think through the course of what I talk about, reflect on your own 
background, aspirations, and the goals that you want to achieve, um, both personal and professional. <clears throat> Forgive me if I look to the side occasionally, but I have written down some notes so that I don't go off piece too much because I have been known to talk too much in the past. So if we can go to um, the first slide, which is just the title um, of the presentation. <clears throat> For anybody who knows um, anything about the Defence Rehabilitation Services, they will know that the strapline is turning adversity into opportunity. And the strapline um, is, is uh, for the Defence Medical Services is because what we have is we have um, people who are in the armed forces who have lost limbs, who have been severely injured. And I've seen them at the Defence Medical Rehabilitation Centre turn that adversity into opportunity. And through some of the charitable work that I've been involved in, seeing these people who have got two or three limbs uh, missing um, and are wearing prosthesis, careering down mountainsides in the Paralympics has been immensely satisfying. And I think that when you talk to people, particularly in the armed forces, who've had adversity, particularly in terms of injury, they do turn that into an opportunity. So I think that's always been very inspirational for me since being in the armed forces, is to see the kind of opportunities that people um, can, can bring from adversity. But more importantly, I'm hoping that I give you an insight into my life and background so that you can see that uh, we make assumptions sometimes about people that are not always um, particularly helpful. So that underlying message throughout what I'm going to talk about over the next 40 minutes is really about learning to know yourself, learning to respect others um, and developing relationships with others that are based on that mutual understanding and support. And I'm a real fan of how do we support other people to be the best that they can be. That is really what drives me more than anything else. So it would be quite useful for me to know who is here today. So I wonder if it's possible for you to type into the chat um, this, what you are actually studying at the university so that I've got an idea of the sort of um, listeners that we've we've got to today's lecture. And I'll give you a minute or so just to do that, just so I get an idea. If it's possible to type into chat. Or will it be in the it might be in the Q&A? Yeah, I'll, I'll monitor the Q&A, Paula. Uh, okay. Nothing in at the moment. Um, oh, no worries. If you want to move to your first slide, I can kind yeah, of, uh, perhaps, perhaps interject fine. when we get somebody here. Yeah. OK, no worries. <clears throat> so I'm going to assume Oh, the chat and Q&A is a few seconds behind, apparently. So I'm going to assume that as we're the College of Health, Psychology and Social Care, that we have students some students hope, um, from the College of Health, Psychology and Social Care, but there might be um, others as well. For those of you who are choosing a path that is in the health professions, um, just to say that, you know, these, these oh, medical trusts are okay. So we're starting to get a few things that are coming up, which is great. Um, I think what's wonderful is that um, those of you that have chosen career paths that are in health and social care, uh, what, a, what a career you've chosen um, and you will get uh, a lot out of it. So I'm starting to see some things coming through. So we've got education and we've got health. That's that's fabulous. That gives me a good idea. So. I feel very, very um, privileged and satisfied to have had a very, very full life and career, um, and I'm hoping that going through today's um, lecture will, will help you to see that and hopefully um, support you in fulfilling your own. I'm really enjoying seeing the things that are coming through. So that's lovely. Thank you. So uh, if we go on to the next slide, just to have a look what today's messages are, and they are very straightforward, really. It's about how we help you and how we support you at the university to follow your dream. Um, I would really like to talk about how we suspend judgment and, and suspend our assumptions about people. And that's not easy to do. Um, those of you that are psychologists or have studied in the cognitive, cognitive psychology will know that we're wired up to put things into categories. But that also leads us sometimes to stereotyping um, and to uh, making assumptions about people we, and making associations that, associations that might not be correct and, and are not always positive. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about your past not having to dictate your future and looking at the title, how we can help 
up to go from adversity to opportunity. Um, I really want to talk about all the way through really how many people underestimate their own ability and what they're capable of. And then finally, because it's a theme that has been underpinning my entirety, um, the entirety of my career, is how we um, respect and include diversity in all areas of our life. So um, I've also um, I'd also, I also think that, that 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 is really important as well that that we have that, that I put diversity all the way through this. So the first slide, and again, this is going to involve um, typing into chat, which I know is a couple of seconds behind. So I might need Stephen to to read back what you say. If we go to the next slide, I just want to ask the question: When you see my name, and my title, and photograph. What assumptions might you make when you see that? And I know you've already had a little bit of a, a rundown of my biography, but if you look at that, what assumptions would you make? And I'm just going to wait for a couple of minutes for Stephen to read back some of the comments that you might make. It can be as brutal as you like. I'm, I'm not picking anything up just yet, Paula, because okay. as I say, there, there may be the delight. But I, I could, I could offer some assumption if you'd like. <laughs> Please do. Okay, so when I when I look at that that picture there, that, that's kind of if you like the official University of Derby picture, it, it tells me that there's someone that's very confident in what they do. They're probably quite a senior person in the organisation. Um, you, you, if I, you, you're obviously a female female leader. You. I would suggest you probably from a white middle class background, um, probably had a, a range of privilege, not been to, you've probably been to a good school, been to uni. Um, I guess the assumptions could go on, but there, there's a starter for 10. Okay, so we've got open, friendly, competent, intelligent, leader. Those are the sort of words that are being used so far. OK, so Stephen, intro and confident and <laughs> no nonsense like that. Professional, highly educated. That's interesting, Hannah. Professional. Thank you, Charlie. Very interesting. Intelligent. Mm. <laughs> it just shows you what, what, what things can. Uh, this is really interesting. Surprise of work with veterans. Thank you, Marina. Friendly, approachable, slightly young. Mm. Oh, right. I'm going to pick that, that one up, Rebecca, later. That's really interesting. That does come into the talk, so thank you. That's a, a good observation. OK, that's really interesting. Devoted, definitely. Yeah. OK, so just so that you're um, aware, I once did this exercise in front of um, a group of. Um, oh, they're still coming through. Yeah, brilliant. So I once did this exercise in front of a group of soldiers and said, you know, what do you think my background has been? And interestingly, a lot of people said what Stephen said, you know, white middle class upbringing, uh, probably went to a nice school, probably went to university. Well, the first thing to say is, and there's a shock horror for you, I haven't been to university. I've only ever studied in my own time um, because my first degree was with the Open University while I was working. So I haven't had the privilege of going to university, um, but I'm very, very pleased that my children have. So what I'm going to do, if it's all right, and it is a little bit personal, but I'm just going to take you through what my background is. So that will help you to understand um, who it is that I am. So if we go on to the next slide. Um, so first of all, these are the sorts of roles that I have. Now, there are two there that are in bold, and that's because at this point in my life, those are probably the two that stand out to me as being the most significant, which is being a mother and being a role model. The mother, because regardless of what you do within your life, you're always going to be a mum. Um, and, and from the time that you have children, that's something that's always going to be there. And then the role model bit is definitely about the fact that I'm very conscious that all of those things you put in the chat there about being professional and having a leadership role means that people look at you and people do role model. So you do have to make sure that your behaviours and the way that you are, 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 are professional, but are also trying to give the right message about how we should be. 
So that's that's the first slide. So I'm going to go on now to the next slide, which will give you an idea of what my background is. So this is a, a photograph of me. So the fat, dumpy 14 month old there is myself. Um, and I was born in Manchester, uh, in not a great part of Manchester. And in that photograph, as I say, I'm 14 months old. Uh, that's my father and in his arms, uh, are my babysitter sister who's just been born. My father in that photograph had just turned 18 years of age and had two children already. We then had another baby sister that was born a year later and unfortunately that sister died. At that point my dad had had three children by the time he was 19, one of whom had died and that was too much for a 19 year old and he left our household for which I hold no resentment whatsoever because for a 19 year old boy um, and especially now I've got children myself who are past that age, that was a lot to contend with. But what happened then was, um, I'm, uh, uh, despite what somebody said, we're talking about, you know, quite a long time ago, the social security system wasn't quite as robust in, in those days. And so we were left in poverty. Um, and we were living in a two up, two down house with no carpets in and an outside toilet, and no central heating and a tin bath in the kitchen that we filled with pans of hot water. And when I say that, my children just laugh and just say, oh, my goodness, mum, you are so old. Um, so it's, it's always a, a bit of fun in our house to talk about what it's like to grow up in that kind of environment. But it was a very, very difficult upbringing. Our clothes came from jumble sales and some people don't even know what a jumble sale is, but it was where you would um, have lots of donated clothing that was sold um, for charity. Um, and so what we had at home was a very, uh, very strange upbringing with a very, very young teenage mother bringing up a couple of children, uh, trying to find her own way in the world with different boyfriends and what have you, but quite a disruptive childhood. Um, I did have another sister that was born um, when, when I was six. And it was really important for me, my raison d'etre from the, as far back as I can remember was to support and bring up my sisters and, and I entirely devoted myself to, to their care and their well-being. Even though my younger sister is only a year younger than me, um, she was an incredibly nervous uh, child and had a, a lot of anxiety issues. So I looked after her really, really well. Um, so if we go on to the next slide. I went to um, a nice primary school um, and I found out that I was I was OK at school. I thrived educationally. I loved reading. Now, one of the bonuses of going to jumble sales and having a, a mum that didn't read is that I, I got into books really, really early. But I did find that from quite an early age, I was picking up titles like Harold Robbins, um, which probably weren't that um, age appropriate. But I did read very widely from a very early age. The only test, and this is why I thought it was quite funny when somebody said intelligence, the only test I never scored highly on at school was an intelligence test, which we had once a term. And I always scored very poorly on intelligence tests. And then in terms of personality, although I had friends, I was a very quiet, underconfident child. Um, those of you who've met me will know that I'm quite tall. I'm five foot eleven um, as, as an adult, but I was always a tall child um, and stooped with my underconfidence as a child as well um, and didn't want to, because I was quite tall, didn't want to be seen sort of thing. Um, I then went on to secondary school and you have to remember that I'm in a, a very poor part of Manchester where aspirations for us were incredibly low. We were actually told more than once at school, there is little point in educating any of you because none of you will achieve anything. In fact, most of you are probably just going to get pregnant at 16 um, and go into a council house. And that was kind of the, the underpinning sort of uh, message that we were given as children. Now, just to briefly have an aside, my two sisters did actually get pregnant before they were 16 and end up in council houses. So that message did actually hit home for both of them um, and they succeeded in terms of their expectations of, of them at school, which does give you an indication that when you do repeat something often enough to a child, they do sometimes think that's their destiny, um, which is a great shame. I then moved to um, a different school um, because what happened is my, my parents decided to, to move 
to uh, a different part of the country, my my mum and the the current stepdad um, and we went and and moved to a different part of the country and I went to a school that even though I was living on a council estate um, there were lots of middle class people there and they talked about something called university and I saw something very very different with a middle class school and middle class children that I'd never seen before so if we go to the next slide what happened was that when I was at that school, I was four, I moved there when I was 14. I just started my O-levels and my mother and her partner um, decided once we'd moved to this new school, we'd only been there about six months and they decided now we don't like it here. We're going to go back to Manchester. And I said, I'm not going back to Manchester. I want to stay here because I think that I can do better here. And even though I was only 14, they uh, I, I, I had to leave home because I wanted to stay where I was. So I just got three or four jobs and uh, moved in with a family where I looked after their children and then worked towards what were called O-levels in the old days, now GCSEs. Um, I then went into sixth form, loved it. I was studying A-level biology, chemistry and maths and I applied to go to the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology to do um, biochemistry and genetics, which was I was really passionate about. Um, unfortunately then, um, um, at the Christmas, at the big, uh, just at the beginning of the upper six, I had to go into hospital for a medical problem and have an operation. And when I was recovering from the operation, the family that I was living with decided that I was no longer welcome in their home. So I was effectively uh, made homeless and um, I didn't know what to do or where to go. So I went back to my school and I had to tell my year head that I was leaving school and wasn't able to complete my A-levels. I didn't have the courage to tell him it's because I had nowhere to live because I was too embarrassed. So he just called me a dropout and said that I'd never come to anything in life and I was just a quitter, um, which broke my heart. I think the reason he was so passionate about me staying at school was that there were so few girls that were doing A-level maths. I think there's only four in our class of 30. So he was quite disappointed that I left school at that point. Um, so I had to go back to Manchester and started work as a, a healthcare assistant in a, a nursing home um, and was living in a, a small flat on a council estate and uh, applied to train as a nurse uh, because I had enough O-levels to do it. Interestingly, once I started my training, the people that lived around me were really critical and were telling me that I was getting above my station and who did I think I was um, from the sort of background that I came from trying to be a nurse? Did I think that I was above everybody else? And it was quite a difficult time and I lost quite a lot of friends at that point. So if we go on to the next slide and I just want to have a, a pause there and say, why is it I'm telling you that? It's not because I want you to say, oh, I feel sorry for me or anything like that. It's because it is so easy, as we saw in that in that narrative earlier, to make assumptions about people and their background. Um, and I also think it's really important that we have to a suspend judgment when we meet people because we don't know what their upbringing has been like or what their life has been like. But we also have to commit ourselves to the fact that the way that our life starts out doesn't have to dictate our future. We have choices and we have crossroads in life and the paths that we choose can take us um, in ways that we that we would never have known happened. I wanted to go to university and I couldn't. I ended up becoming a, a nurse, but actually it was probably the best thing that I could have done because I've had the an outstanding career. But if you are dealt a tricky hand, it is up to us to try and shape our lives. So once I started being a nurse, how did my career progress? So if we move on to the next slide. And as was um, as Stephen has articulated, um, I trained to be what was called a registered general nurse in the old days. because We're talking about the um, 1980s um, and I became an RGN and then to, became a staff nurse in acute medicine. Absolutely loved it. But in the old days, as I call it, in the 80s, a medical ward was a very, very acute area to be. And we had regular cardiac arrests and we had regular deaths that happened. And I'd been working in that area for about 18 months and wanted to be a better nurse from a mental health perspective. So decided to convert. And in those 
you could do an 18 month conversion course to be a mental health nurse, which is what I did. Going into mental health was one of those massive light bulb moments. Within medicine, once you kind of learn particular ways of working, you can probably anticipate going forward um, the sort of things that you're, so let's say you're learning how to deal with an arrhythmia. In medicine, once you've learned how to do that, you know what medicines you need and what steps you need to take to adjust it. In mental health, I learned quite rightly, every single person is different and everybody's problem is different. So that made it very exciting and very interesting. And so I was hooked into mental health. The curriculum that I studied in mental health was a very interesting one as well. We were taught all the way through our training, no labels, no diagnosis, only ever see people for who they are and what they bring and deal with the problems and issues that they bring to you. Don't make judgments and don't put a label on it. The label doesn't help. Now, the label does help in terms of diagnoses, to be fair. But um, at the same time, um, it is really good to have a view of people that always starts with who they are first and what their issues are. So once I started doing my mental health nursing, I also started doing my Open University degree. Now, it might you, you might not know this, but um, when I trained as a nurse, it had no academic credit whatsoever. So when I started my Open University degree, I had no credits and had to do the entire degree, uh, which takes six years. And that was fine. I then don't ask me why I was going down the high street in, in Stockport and walked past the re army recruiting office and said, could I join the army as a nurse? And they went, oh, yeah, of course you could. I knew nothing about the army at all. Um, and so I applied to join the army, uh, expecting there'd be no chance of being accepted. Next slide, please. Uh, but I was. Um, now, in these days, um, I had a very, very thick Manchester accent. and I know it's gone now because I've lived in all different parts of the world. But I did. Uh, so I was really surprised to have admitted into the army and I was actually admitted as an army officer, which was even more of a shock that they take some girl from Manchester and she would be an officer was a bit of a shock to me. So my first job in the army was to look after an acute psychiatric ward in a military hospital based in London. And at that time we were taking casualties from the Gulf, mental health casualties from the Gulf. Um, I then moved on and uh, went and did my community mental health nursing course at the same time as I was uh, doing community psychiatry across South East England, which meant visiting soldiers in their barracks and visiting families um, who needed mental health support that were all associated with the military. I then went out to the um, to Bosnia in the, a very early tour when it was pretty traumatic. The war was in full flow at that point with the Muslims, Croats and Serbs um, all killing each other basically at that point. Um, but I was the first female that was armed in that role because females were um, allowed to bear arms from 1992 and I went out in 1993. And putting a female in this role because I was um, I had to move around um, Bosnia and Croatia on my own back of armoured vehicles, helicopters or whatever to treat people. Um, it was it was seen as something that for, for uh, at that time would be challenging for a female. But, um, you know, give me challenge is what I say. Now, the reason that I thought the comment earlier was amusing was if you look at the top picture in 1993, I was a very experienced mental health nurse at that point, but I looked about 12, I think. Um, and so I was actually um, it was a disadvantage looking younger because people would say, well, what do you know? What do you know about life? which was really interesting because by that point I did actually know quite a bit about life, to be fair. Um, when I left Bosnia from that first tour, I went and looked after a, a quite a large part of North Germany and um, there was masses of um, soldiers and their wives there. A lot of young wives as well who were um, in Germany on their own with young children. Um, with their partners having gone off serving in Bosnia and in other areas. Went back to Bosnia again um, with NATO this time because it's UN the first time. And then my final job in the military, oh, when I got married um, just before I went on that second Bosnia tour. Um, and then um, studied, uh, 
and I was still studying my, um, I'd, I think I'd finished my degree by then as well. Um, I know that I was um, finishing my degree when I was in Bosnia, which was interesting with the university. Um, my last job in the army was setting up community psychiatry for Scotland because though we didn't have any community psychiatry up there. Um, and I had the privilege of living in Edinburgh Castle um, whilst I was doing that job, which was uh, really, really good. Once my uh, I got pregnant, um, it didn't just happen. Uh, it was planned, and um, and I left the army because I didn't want to go back on operations when I had a baby. I wanted to be at, at home with that baby. And in those days, if you had um, a baby and your baby was weaned, you were you were liable to be um, to sent somewhere, and I didn't want to do that. So moving on to the next slide, um, as now a parent, um, I went back into the NHS and uh, had two jobs. One was um, uh, that I developed a service for mentally disordered offenders. Um, and I also had um, another job that was looking after a drug and alcohol service. And so I spent the next sort of um, quite a few years, actually, um, probably about three or four years, just committing myself really to drug rehab and to mental disordered offenders, lots of people who were in and out of prison but had mental disorders and making sure that mental that people with mental health issues were treated correctly and appropriately within the criminal justice system, which was a, a great job. job. I worked very closely with the police and with probation um, over those years. I also had a second child during this time as well. So if we go on to the next slide, um, I applied to go into academia. Don't ask me why. Again, I mean, some of these things, you just these are just these crossroads. And you think, oh, there's a lecturer post at our local university. I think I'll apply. Um, so I did and I was successful. Um, and I'm not going to bore you with the progression through a university career, but obviously being a lecturer and then a principal lecturer and a head of and and just progressed through the university system. And at the same time, um, I had been uh, I've been a single parent since my children were very young. Um, largely because, and, and it's no disrespect to their father, he remained in the army and we didn't see each other. And so it was, I became a single parent. Um, but also, and some of you may recognise this, a wannabe super mum. So even though I was pursuing a career, it was really, really important that I gave my children what I thought was the best uh, upbringing that I possibly could. I was also really focused on staying fit. Um, and during that period of working in academia. I did my um, teaching certificate and then went on to study a PhD. Um, and the usual routine was look after the go to work um, of your children, nursery, work, come home in the evening, see to the children, give them quality time and then study um, in the evenings. Um, so it wasn't the most sociable of lives, but it was worth it, definitely worth it. So that's where where I was with regard to um, sort of my life in academia in the last few years. So the next slide just asks where I am now. And um, I think that I'm happy. My sons are doing really well. They're age 20 and 22. Uh, one is working full time. The other one is at university studying politics. Um, and uh, and I've got a lovely dog who's been great company during lockdown. The other thing that's happened over the last few years is I do have a couple of hidden disabilities which I don't talk about um, and I've now started to talk about that a little bit more which has been really helpful actually um, and it made me realise how much we are worried about being stereotyped um, and uh, pigeonholed because we have certain characteristics. Um, so going on to the next slide, as Stephen has articulated, um, I am now uh, really committed to doing the best that I can in a wide range of areas. And my current roles include working at the university as a pro vice chancellor and dean. That means I work with the executive, but I also look after the College of Health, Psychology and Social Care, which has around about 6,700 students in the college and about 280 staff. Um, really big, vibrant college, which is great. 
Um, I also um, am very committed to the Soldiers Arts Academy, work closely with veterans, um, many of whom have been traumatised and we put them on the stage uh, and we, we do art and singing and all sorts of things with them. Um, we've had a run in the West End with one of our plays, Soldier On, um, which was fantastic. But we also see a lot of our veterans who come and um, come to the Soldiers Arts Academy end up with good jobs, which is brilliant. Um, I also support um, Stand2 um, and I'm a patron of that charity, which offers support to veterans with alcohol issues. And then I have lots of governor and regulation type work as well, which might seem less interesting. Um, but if we go to the next slide, so this might seem a digression, but it isn't. Um, it's why what's something that's underlied my whole career, and I think it's because of my roots is that we have to strongly recognise all the differences of the people around us and what they bring to our lives and what they bring to life itself and our world. Our differences, our backgrounds, our learning styles, our abilities, our race and our religion and our beliefs, all part of what forms our identity and the identity of our world. And I've been passionate about equality and diversity, inclusivity and well-being um, for the entirety of my career. And I feel that's really important. I take very seriously my role as an LGBT plus ally um, and as my role model to support females who want to progress in their careers. Uh, and I will take every opportunity to support um, equality and diversity. So if we go to the next slide, these are the reasons why I do believe that as if we are mindful of equality, diversity and inclusivity, it's going to promote tolerance and understanding and enrich our world and experiences. We know from a business perspective, if we want to go to that level, that businesses that are supportive and inclusive are the ones that thrive and that enhance our economy. So it, it does have many, many advantages. Um, and I think all of us have a duty to be able to um, support through education, um, of others and ourselves what protected characteristics mean and what equality and diversity mean. I think we all have um, a duty to challenge and to challenge all of those isms, those microaggressions. We all have a, a duty to role model and to mentor and importantly to be advocates as well. And many of you within your professions when you leave university um, or in your professions now will be doing that. So if we go on to the next slide, what do I think were the barriers um, and struggles for me, which may or may not um, uh, re resonate with you? Um, I think that it was class and poverty. I think we put ourselves in a box sometimes with regard to class and our upbringing. But I'm very aware that I did have a chip on my shoulder. The reason I went all the way through to doing a PhD was not because I was I was thirsty to learn, it's because I had something to prove. And I admit that now. Um, but also I've come to a place where I now know that being good enough is OK. You can't be good at everything. I always wanted to be the best mum, the best at what I did at work, the best advocate for others. But you can't always be that. We have to get to a point where we're good enough. Always having something to prove is a huge, huge burden to carry. Um, and, and I've carried that for a long time and I think that I'm dropping that now, which is good. But it's taken a long time. Um, I'm 54 years of age and it's taken quite a while to get to that point of giving that up. Um, I think that I've always struggled um, with wanting to keep up with men, particularly in the army. I did everything the men did. So I've always been very mindful that I don't want to be treated negatively as a female. And now I take that forward in a lot of my work and my age as well. Somebody said I look young and I think that that's OK, but it does sometimes mean you're not always taken seriously or you're not always seen as being experienced enough. I'm going to say that a huge struggle for me was that barrier, which many of you are female or male on the call will recognise, which is being there versus working for your children. That's really hard. And then the last barrier, and, and this is a difficult one for me to admit, is envy. Um, it's really difficult when you go through life, particularly early life, thinking, why is life so hard for me and it looks so easy over there? What I've learned is that it isn't easy over there and people have their own issues. People have the, their own things that are holding them back. 
I used to um, mix with with mothers, for example, who I thought had it all. They're driving the nice car. They're going out for coffee. Many of them felt trapped. Many of them had their own difficulties. Some were depressed. Some it, it didn't mean just because you have everything on the outside that on the inside that life is good. So I've learned to give up on envy as well. But that was something that was a barrier and a struggle in the early days. So going on to the next slide, um, what I have actually learned, and I'm just going to go through this really quick because this is just about me and I apologise, but I've learned to rely on myself. And I think that relying on yourself and, and being as resilient as you can, and I don't just mean from a mental health perspective, not always expecting others to rescue, but to think about how you can solve things yourself. Not always easy, but I, I have learned to, to be self-reliant. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Being the author of your destiny is, is important. Not just being led but, um, or just going with it, but thinking about how you manage it along the way. Not always relying on superiors to be helpful. Some are, some aren't. aren't. Um, please don't limit your options. If anything, stretch yourself. I've learned over life that you are always more competent than you think you are. You think you're a certain level, but you're usually more competent than that. You learn so much more from things not going well than things going well. So it's OK to get it wrong sometimes. In areas like health and education, we do a lot of reflection. And what we learn from that is that when something goes wrong, we can probably learn five or six ways to do it differently. When something goes right, it goes right. So getting things wrong is OK. Be values led. The values, what you hold in your heart, your principles that are inside you are what's going to underpin everything you do. And that needs to be uh, something that, that you allow allowed to lead you is your values and challenging isms and we've already touched on that but that's really important to me don't regret missing opportunities and this is important for me for people that know me well patience and tolerance are virtues that i've had to learn i am not i was not a naturally patient or probably tolerant person i had to learn that and the next slide just talks about the top tips really for me um, was about learning to be assertive. I was a very quiet, shy person and it wasn't until I learned to stand up and speak that I got heard and that's not easy. Please be kind to yourself. Balance is important, but that's your view of balance. Uh, for me, balance was actually about, about me working hard and playing hard. And if that meant I did a 12 or 14 hour day, that was fine. But have something to look forward to as well. That's been difficult during lockdown, but that is a top tip that's got me through. Always having something in the diary to look forward to. Spend time supporting others to grow and thrive. You get so much from that. And aim, aim higher than you should think. One that's been difficult for me is listen more than you speak because I talk too much. Uh, reserving judgment has helped me. Don't judge when I see. Think first and make the best of support offered and don't be afraid to ask for it. But importantly, always be yourself. And the final couple of slides are really just things that inspire me. And what I've put um, on this next slide is I was listening to an interview with, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Dr. Maggie Adrian Pocock. She is amazing. And if you get the chance, have a read of her story. She has really had, she had the most difficult childhood. She was definitely written off. And I mean, completely written off. Um, and she even put there it was a bit depressing. But you know what? It's been amazing. She has she said that the clang has made her into a space scientist. But whenever you see her, her enthusiasm, her position as a role model is outstanding. And then if we go to the next slide, the other people who inspire me are you as students and staff. Really, really important. I'm going to answer that question about assertiveness later, Jade, because that's a really good question. I think what inspires me is that over this COVID period, I have seen students continuing to learn and staff continuing to teach. They've been homeschooling, they've been dealing with the pandemic, they've been dealing with ill health themselves and they've carried on and juggled life. And we have all learned how to juggle life and keep the wheels on. And this past year has been a complete inspiration for me. I knew our students and our staff were amazing and outstanding, but you know what? It's it's even better in terms of our students in health psychology and social care and our staff. It's choosing careers that will see them having a significant and meaningful impact that is truly inspirational for me. 
I've enjoyed every minute of being a nurse and I still consider myself to be a nurse. But to know that many people are coming behind me or alongside me who are just as committed to impacting on the lives of others is just amazing. And then I do want to just mention our staff that we've got uh, within the college who I know have had to work with creativity and innovation to support our students. Um, and, uh, and that has really inspired me over the last year. So finally, and it is a finally now, um, on the last slide, if we move on, please don't underestimate how amazing you are and never underestimate what you're capable of because you are amazing. And then I'm going to hand over to Stephen now on the next slide to just do some questions and answers. Thank you, Paula. Um, that, that was as inspirational as I thought it would be. I, I've been working with Paula for a number of, uh, of, of years on and off in various things now and, and feel as I know Paula really well. But that's the kind of thing that kind of inspires me daily to to see how people and such as Paula have, have achieved. But I, I do also think she's the only person I know that's ever lived in a castle. So I'm, what, <laughs> why, why wouldn't you want to work with someone like that? Um, I, I uh, There's lots of people in the chat now offering comments and observations and a lot of people have said how much their your story resonates with them as well. So there is something there, the kind of human connection and this kind of urge to obviously want to try and achieve our best, no matter what the odds sometimes is something that I think has been been picked up on by a few people. Can I just take advantage while I've got got the floor, if you like, to ask about. So one day you're walking down the high street <laughs> in Stockport. And you decide I'm going to join the British Army. There's got to be more to it than that, Paula. What, what were you thinking? Well, that's. I don't know if I'm. I, I can yet. Yeah. So I, I don't know. Uh, this, it's that was as random as that. I'd literally finished a shift and I was going shopping in the precinct in Stockport, and I walked past and I saw a photograph in the window of soldiers, and there was a female soldier, and I didn't. I didn't really know you had female soldiers. Um, I was naive, knew nothing about the army. So I literally just popped my head in. I didn't even walk in. I popped my head through the door and said, do you have nurses in the army? <laughs> it was that naive. And he went, yeah, what have you got? And I said, I'm an RGN, RM. And he went, ooh, you might be an officer. And it was just that conversation that set the ball rolling. Um, and I've got no other explanation than it was just one of those I saw a picture of a woman in uniform and thought, hmm, I hadn't thought of that before. So that's one of those sliding door moments, if anybody's seen the film, where life takes a very different trajectory just because you make a choice at that point. Thank, thanks, Paula. I, it, it strikes me that you, you, you just don't take no for an answer, do you? So you weren't <laughs> supposed to go to a good school. You weren't supposed to get your O levels. You weren't supposed to become a nurse. You weren't supposed to be a... a, a in the military you weren't supposed to lead services but somehow you just kind of won't <laughs> accept no for an answer will you really that's a message i'm taking home w one yeah. comment that i would like to make is that um and again i this is partly from my interest in research and i know you shared in some of that there is this sense that um, many people kind of uh, aspire to those kind of uh, you know careers and and trajectories and when they get there it, it's not particularly where they want to be. You know, there's still this emptiness about what they've done. So they might have had a hard background and then they, they make it into a, a profession, but they're always constantly chasing something else. Um, and I, I'm not saying that's the case particularly with you, but what I would be interested in to say is for you to kind of comment on, are you different? Are you a different person from that child in the back garden in the council estate? Or are you still you? Do you know what, Stephen? I think that's a really sort of deep and philosophical question in some respects, because um, as I alluded to, and I don't want to get too upset about it, but both my sisters um, did listen to the messaging that was given to them. And I go and visit both sisters, both of whom had children at 16 and both of their eldest children had children at 16. And um, and we've just and we've just seen this this kind of cycle of deprivation. And I genuinely don't know what it is that was inside me or that motivated me to be different. I can only my only explanation is what I've said about going to a school where I saw middle class children that I'd never seen before and thinking, gosh, could I be like that? Um, and 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 it 
I don't know what that was, but I wish there was something that we could bottle in terms of an essence that allowed people to have a higher level of self-belief and that weren't held back by what other people say, actually, you'll never get anywhere or, you know, it, it's it's how do we help people to, and this is why I'm so committed to, um, I don't know whether everybody knows, but Derby City is an opportunity area and we work with Derby schools to try and support children to aspire to be, um, to, to go to university, to have careers. Um, and that's a really important part of the work that we do as a university to support our local area in terms of aspiration. Aspiration and supporting aspiration in children has got to be one of the most important things that we do. I, I would agree, Paul, a uh, uh, really interesting observation there. And I think, you know, I think many of us probably end up involved in the careers we do because of that wanting to kind of help someone else or or understand someone else's journey as well. Charles asks a really interesting question. What's your what's been a career highlight so far, Paula, and and what might that become in the future, perhaps? <laughs> That's it is an interesting question because I think the number of highlights are huge, you know, um, absolutely huge. I think that, you know, I did end, I think one of the highlights for me was probably the first six month tour of Bosnia, which is one of the toughest parts of my life. Being under fire constantly, uh, going through the streets of Sarajevo, taking bullets to a, um, a, a soft skin vehicle was not something you expect to do as part of your career. Being dropped in a helicopter on the top of a mountainside because the soldiers flipped out at the top is not something you expect to be doing. But it was just amazing. And I had six months with no money. Uh, no clothes of my own apart from the uniform I was wearing. Um, you weren't going out, you weren't, and it was just, there was, the minimalism of it was just amazing in some respects. And I think that's a real highlight is learning that you can, you just need other people. You don't need stuff. All I had for six months was what I could carry on my back. That was it. Um, and, and I think that learning that you don't need stuff has probably been a real highlight. And, and it means that, um, I learn never to be, I'm not materialistic. Stuff doesn't mean a lot. Experiences mean the world to me. Being with people, doing things, seeing things, going to different parts of the world, seeing other cultures. Those are the things that are really meaningful. But I think that's really difficult in terms of career highlight because um, another career highlight that just jumps into my head is um, standing um, at graduation and watching the first group of nursing associates walk across the stage. And these were people that were healthcare assistants, all ages, um, all sorts of backgrounds, wanted to be a nurse, didn't have a clutch of A-levels. And uh, the average age was probably mid thirties. And they just walked across the stage in tears and their families were in tears because they were pursuing their career they loved and weren't held back just because they didn't have A-levels. Um, and I haven't got my A-levels either. So, you know, that kind of resonated with me watching that. That was a real highlight too. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I'm just going to move on because there's some kind of really interesting and related questions there. Quite a couple of people in the, the chat have, have, um, have recognised your honesty and frankness around your hidden disabilities. And I think that's really encouraging that you as a kind of role model are able to to discuss those and, yeah. and if you like, surface those. But have they, how have they, if you could, if you feel you're able to, mm. how, have, how have they kind of shaped you? Uh, what what have you used them as a positive? Do they are, are they something that kind of has been part of your motivation, or or are they just something you've had to park and get on with, or have you have you used them positively? It's a good question. Um, the main there's a couple of extra things that have happened recently, which have uh, which I've had to add to the list. But in terms of the um, the hidden disability from being a child, it's pretty severe dyspraxia. Um, I am the child that as a child would always fall over all the time and and, and it, it, it even now at 54 I still fall over if I don't look where I'm putting my feet I will fall over now you can imagine what that was like being in the army and marching you can imagine what that's been like when I've had to learn to and don't 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 get upset about this but learning to handle a weapon uh, when you you can't work out depth 
and you are, you know, all fingers and thumbs and, and you're clumsy. I was always called a very clumsy child and that was a very difficult label, especially as I'm tall. So living with clumsiness and tallness and knowing that you are dyspraxic was very difficult. So I think um, in the early days that made me cower and, and sort of just sink into myself most of the time because I knew that I'd fall over. I've fallen over on the wards at work when I've been walking down the middle of a ward. Um, it's been it's been difficult. Um, I'd like to say I've learned to laugh at myself, but I haven't. I still find it incredibly frustrating. But I do appreciate now that when you look at somebody, you don't always know if there is a disability that they have. And we've just got to be really mindful of that and supportive of people because we don't know what internal battles are going on. Thank, thank you, Paul. I'm going to uh, carry on if we can, because some fascinating uh, questions. Paul, just take this one and then a, an opportunity to summarise there. Um, a couple of people are asking about the the sense of never giving up, which seems to be a, a current theme. But sometimes you just don't know what you don't know. And lots of people in the audience, uh, and, and I'm one of them, I guess, have, have kind of come at this uh, from a second career, a second chance. Do, do you want to make any observations about that? Because you've had like, you kind of had a number of turns where you've gone in different directions, haven't you? And I think what I'm getting, it's never too late, is it? No, and some of it is really interesting. I think some of it is because um, if, when you go into a health career like being a nurse, you never have to be bored. You know, I've worked in medicine, I've worked in mental health, I've worked with mental disorder defenders, I've worked with drugs and alcohol, I've now worked in academia. The amount of things you can do is vast. So if you choose a career where you've got lots of opportunities, to do different things, you'll never get bored. And, and I hate to say it, but I think that is something that has been part of me. If I get to a point where something is not giving me the same sort of stimulation and excitement, you think, hmm, what else could I do? Now, some would see that as, as a, a negative rather than a positive, but um, for me, it's just made those twists and turns possible because I've wanted to try something different or do something different. Um, and it's a really terrible cliche to use. You only live once. You have to enjoy what you do. Work is a big part of your life. And if you don't enjoy it, that's not great. Mm. Thank you, Paula. Can't some wise words there. I guess if I just in the last minute or two, just thinking about that as you were talking through and scribbled some notes there. Uh, and I'm just fascinated by some of the things that you mentioned. Um, the thing about not being good enough. Um, and the imposter syndrome. I think it's fascinating mm -hmm. how even such as you feel of that or have, mm -hmm. have wrestled with that in your own career. And I know many other people have, have, have said that that's the case with them, always feeling as though you should be better as well. Um, I, I'm, I'm really interested in fascinating how you kind of explored the issue of being a female leader and how that might make you different from the, the traditional male leadership role and how you've, you've brought some of those examples into your into your work, both in the military, the NHS, and now in higher education. Um, how you've moved, adapted and changed, I think is a real interesting lesson. I think many people get confident in a career and stick at it, whatever. You haven't, uh, you've challenged yourself to do different things and to put yourself into a uncomfortable space sometimes. And I think finally that, that balancing of career and home and family to you mm -hmm. to me they seem that they're as equally important to you even now even in the yeah. you know the kind of pressure and the challenges that you face um that balance is still quite important to you isn't it i think absolutely and 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 there's not a right answer either is the Stephen. there's not a right answer to that and we all have to find our own balance but um, you just have to know in your own mind what you're prioritizing and what's most important to you and what it is that's going to make you happy yes thank you i couldn't agree more i think i think that that's it it's it's you know we strive for lots of things in our lives but getting the balance is probably sometimes the hardest thing to do isn't it absolutely so um that that's just about the end of our session, we're coming up to time. It's been fascinating. I'd, I'd like to, again, extend my thanks to, to Dr. Paula Holt, MBE, for a, a kind of stimulating, fascinating topic and discussion, something that just resonates with all of us, really. And, and I know that when she talks about these things, she really means them, and that actually that lived experience is, is, is the reason why she leads the way she does. And I, I'd just like to thank, uh, on behalf of everybody that's attended, uh, Paula and all everyone that's been involved in organising these series of talks. It's uh, 
it's a fascinating thing to be involved in and, and we're really delighted that you could contribute in the way you've done so thank you Thank you and thanks to everybody for joining and if there are any questions that people specifically want to ask then I'm more than happy for people to email, that would be absolutely fine. Thank you everyone, thanks Thank for you. attending. Thank you.